I'm Julia Hobsbawm from Editorial Intelligence. James Crabtree is going to guide you through this morning's wonderfully apposite and broad-ranging topics. We have a you know a range of maybe three issues that we can focus on this morning, which um, will partly be discussed at Copenhagen, but partly concern all of you in the audience. So I'll start with uh, with Jesse from uh, from E3G, which stands for Third Generation Environmentalism, which is an environmental NGO which she describes as the diplomats of the climate change NGOs. I think many of the negotiating teams with whom I spend most of my waking hours at the moment have come to this with um, a competitive approach. The negotiation mode we're dealing with, the policy regime which it's trying to specify, are still essentially based on the Kyoto Protocol. And the Kyoto Protocol was written by environment ministers. And my greatest frustration, I think, at the moment is that environment ministers don't have the political muscle they don't really have the intellectual resources and they certainly don't have the financial resources to tackle the scale of the problem. In terms of political framing, I think we've also had a series of problems around the focus on fairness, on burden sharing within negotiations. More broadly, behind the formal negotiation process, there is a sea change in the quality of the debate. And that is a debate about the economy and climate change, and that is the fundamental debate that will take us to the solutions. We would argue that the era of cheap energy is over, and that is probably the single most important topic to talk about on climate change, and we should be concentrating on the dividends of clean energy. Gavin is the Senior Vice President here at Unilever, so we have to be grateful for him, both for the elegant surroundings in which we are hosting this debate, but also he leads uh, Unilever's work on sustainability. I think the only contribution I can make to this conversation is... Uh, to look at the issue through the lens of one um, large multinational corporation. If you look at a business like this one, um, and you look right across its value chain, from the sourcing of its raw materials all the way through to the manner in which consumers use and then dispose of our products, our impacts are enormous. Our factories, for example, would be about 3 million tonnes, our total impact across our value chain, we believe to be well more than 100 times that amount, so a material amount. So we have a big um, burden at that end, but perhaps um, also an equally large burden at the end of our consumers. That forces us to consider how we design products, how we recommend people consume them, how we recommend people use them and which is certainly driving a lot of management behavior now in the business. And two of the big things that are going to come up in Copenhagen are that recompensing the poorest nations and looking after them as they start to feel the impacts of climate change. And of course, the other absolutely massive issue is the question of deforestation. Deforestation is reckoned to cause 17% of the carbon activity that uh, is into our planet. China, again, very scarily, despite the its actual geographical size and its massive population only has, of its whole land mass, only 7% you are able to grow on. So China gets its food from elsewhere. Most of the deforestation in Brazil is for Chinese cattle and again to provide soya for Chinese food. You're, you're coming up, as I say, against very complicated cultural um, and economic uh, issues that seem to me very difficult to legislate about. That's, again, an unsustainable and extremely weird way to go about it. So I will leave you on that. Our penultimate speaker on the panel is John Crackett, who's the managing director uh, of Central Networks for Eon UK. Um, I have to tell you that I do care quite deeply about all of this. I care about energy and where it's going to come from in the future. I believe that we have to reduce the amount of carbon we're pushing into the atmosphere. We have to have a global... Uh, agreement which will restrain that and that's why I think you know as far as I'm concerned Copenhagen is plan A. Despite energy saving the amount of electricity that's going to be generated and used in this transition is actually going to go up. The reason for that of course is that a lot of the renewable sources will generate electricity lots of money will have to be invested. Ofgen themselves uh, estimate over 250 billion over the next 15 years. I think we need policymakers to take bold steps to secure international agreement on carbon reduction. I think we need individuals to understand the challenge and take personal responsibility. Businesses need to do what they do best, which is stepping up to the plate and delivering these solutions, the right solutions, and delivering them quickly.
Professor Graciela Cicilnewski to my left. She's the author of the published or soon to be published, is it out yet? Just, Just out, Saving Kyoto. We got to make a deal in Copenhagen, okay? And the situation is actually good. We do seem to have now an agreement among the wealthy nations on limiting emissions. For as long as we don't actually do what we need to do in physical terms, the climate change could continue. We need the third generation carbon capture technology, which is carbon negative. This technology has the ability to build power plants that suck carbon from air and mobilize the profit and the profit making energy industry that we just heard about into doing what they do best, channel those funds to change the $50 trillion energy industry worldwide and to bring unity of the world, to the world economy while in the process of resolving this untractable issue of climate change. Um, so I was wanting to pick up on the, the mention of deforestation and specifically on, on RED, the efforts to reduce deforestation uh, to reduce the, the contribution of about 20% of all greenhouse gas emissions that comes there from. I wonder what, whether the panelists can give their view on whether we're going to have a successful red agreement at Copenhagen. Um, so you'll know as well as I do that we every year we lose, I think it's about an area the size of Greece in terms of tropical rainforests. Um, it's terrifying. And yet it ought to be the one issue we can address. What drives that, um, what drives deforestation? Big agriculture drives it and poverty drives it, essentially. Um, um, whilst I think there is, um, you know, red conceptually ought to be the thing that we're going after hardest and with the greatest urgency, um, the practical problems of making that work on the ground are just formidably difficult. Uh, fuel poverty is certainly going to be politically difficult. What do you think a UK government could and should do about that? I have a bit of a radical view on fuel poverty, uh, which is there isn't any such thing. Um, there's just poverty. We have the most appalling housing stock in the UK, and the people who are poorest live in the worst housing stock, and they are unable to do anything about it. Well, you can't enter this discussion sceptically without somebody either calling you a denier or saying that you're working for big oil. But there is a danger that that has led to cynicism amongst the public because it's become a closed discussion. And even, James, when you started off saying, how can we get consumers to change their behaviour? That's one debate. How can we get the government to bring in regulations? That's another debate. They're not debates. <laughs> They're policy outcomes. They bear no relation to science and evidence. And yet somehow, whenever you have a discussion on this issue, everybody says, well, I broadly agree. I don't think that's healthy for democracy. Um, people, I think, are scared, so they're therefore trying to deny it and trying to drum that up. The real scientists say um, exactly, you, know, you cannot predict everything, but you can certainly predict a very, very, very high scale of risk. So um, to the deniers, I say, pull your head out of the sand. All you need to take action is to have a reasonable chance of a potentially catastrophic event, not to be sure. I would say that one issue we didn't raise uh, uh, in the debate is geoengineering, one of the technical potential fixes. And if you want, if you want, okay, we did raise it once. If you want to learn more about that, it'll be on the front cover of Prospect Magazine next month. Uh, beyond that, I'd just like to thank everyone for coming and all of our panelists this morning, and uh, wish you a very good day. So thank you very much.